they were having all kinds of problems. Finally, they called the police. The police came and saw something and saw a hand reaching out. And when they kept calling out and it wouldn't respond, they just emptied a full clip into the floor. And when they opened up the door, there was nothing there. There was no trace of blood. There was nothing. And there was no way that they missed. They were, you know, a foot and a half, two feet away from this thing, just emptying rounds into the area where this being was. And so many people had continued to have weird experiences. And then you find out, well, there was a... My name is Misty Gaither and welcome to Quest, a journey into true crime and the paranormal. I am so excited to have my very special guest here with me tonight, Dave Schrader, everyone. How you doing, Dave? I'm doing great, Misty. Thanks for having me. Of course. You know, I'm sure everybody knows who you are and you know that you were on the Holzer Files, the Ghost of De Devil's Perch, and of course, in The Curse of Lizzie Borden. And mm -hmm. I mean, you've been around in the paranormal field for a while, huh? Yeah, about 18 years now. I've been actively involved in it with both my radio shows, live travel events, and full on investigations. Now, you do have an event, and I'm actually going to get to meet you in person on March the 23rd here at, uh, in New Iberia at the Cajun mm -hmm. uh, Paracon. So I'm going to be set up there also. So I'll get to meet you in person. And I think that Excellent. is like way cool and, and uh, can talk. But, I, you know, whenever I have someone on, I like to do a little research about, you know, who I'm going to be talking to and, and, sure. and, you know, not maybe ask the same questions over and over that um, everybody else does. But let's talk about something important. And that is Bloody Mary's. You like the drink. Bloody Mary. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. All right. I don't know if you know or not, but in New Orleans would have a Bloody Mary festival. And I didn't be, know that. Oh yeah, and it would be nothing but Bloody Marys. And and I thought about you when I found out that you know you are partial to them, and I was like, well, you know, Dave, he just might like to come to the festival one time and see. Yeah, check it I, was, out. I just saw there's a new dill pickle vodka. And I was just telling my wife today that I bet with Zing Zang, that would make an amazing Bloody Mary. Oh, yeah. I mean, definitely. Uh, Zing Zang, of course, is the best. And do you like your Bloody Marys? you like them spicy or not so much? Or, or is there anything, uh, you know, unique? I, I like them to have a little flavor. I don't like, like my dad wants some nuclear. <laughs> he wants to be sweating. Oh, yeah. And dripping hot. I like it just to have a little pop. Little, little sizzle to it, but not hot, hot. Now, what about like when you go places or you see pictures and they have the chicken sticking out of the Bloody Mary and the, the bacon and the mm -hmm. uh, the big uh, celery stick? And, and I mean, is that something you go for? Or you're just like, no, don't frill it up. Let's just do the Bloody Mary. Hell no, frill it up. Life is short. There is one place I got to try to find the picture. It's got a skewer running through a piece of pizza, a hot dog and a hamburger that's all stuck into the Bloody Mary, and it's like a $25 Bloody Mary. Oh. I want it. That's that's one of my goals is eventually to get to that restaurant that serves that. But, yeah, I like all the little fixings, the olives and celery, mm -hmm. and sometimes they do bacon strips, candied bacon strips. I'm all for it. Yeah, why not? Like you said, you only live once, and, um, mm -hmm. you know, why not do it up and do it up right? I really enjoyed, you know, like the series that you're on. Um, I met, uh, well, I haven't met him in person, but actually Sam Baltrusis was my first guest on my show here. And I know that y'all did the Curse of Lizzie Borden together. So I was just wondering, you know, because, you know, when I was watching that, and I don't believe in all the episodes and different shows that I've seen you on, I haven't seen you being taken over by a spirit. Now, I've seen you hurt and get pushed, right. but I haven't seen you, get, you know, get taken over by a spirit like what happened at the Lizzie Borden house. Yeah, that was really unnerving. Um, and again, it's, it's one of those kind of things that you have to consider when you're entering into this field and kind of entering into a covenant with a spirit. When I'm there, putting myself forward to communicate and, you know, in that that instance i said you know prior to our investigation and prior to the little seance we did that you know that uh i i hope to make communication and if you need me in any way to help this happen and i just didn't think it meant through me and mm. what i didn't know is chris fleming the medium it's yes. one of my best friends and guys i've i've known for 18 years now 
he had kind of set that intention to let me have the experience. And I didn't know that. Oh. So when my when we were originally holding hands for the seance and this twitching and arm flopping started, mm -hmm. I thought, well, what the hell's wrong with Chris? Oh, you uh, thought it was him. I thought it was him until yeah. he let go of my hand and I realized my hand was the one freaking out. And then he said, I know what this is. I know what this is. Give me a pen. And Dave, keep your eyes closed, relax, just let this happen. And it was, you know, going into an automatic writing session, which was really unnerving when you're not used to having that ability and feeling, I say, it's like when your arm falls asleep, mm -hmm. right? And you're, you're looking at it and you're like, I can't get it to move. I can't do it. This is such a weird sensation. Well, right. imagine that, but then your arm starts to do things and, and starts writing and you have no control over it. That was so weird and unnerving to me. And I wish I hadn't fought it as hard as I did. I kept kind of, I guess, me mentally and physically pushing back on it, not wanting to have that experience because it was so foreign to me and made me just feel uh, awkward. So I wish I would have not fought that as, as tough. And I wish I would have been able to be a little bit more into the moment and have enjoyed it. But it was, it was pretty exciting. Now, do you think that Lizzie was guilty? You know, out of respect to her and what that that meeting that day meant, mm -hmm. I really don't think it matters anymore. And right. I think the fact that whether she was mentally kind of split down the middle and part of her was involved in this murder or she was fully cognizant, I, I think we've, she, she's, what's the word I'm looking for here? She has done her time and had been treated really poorly in life afterwards, even though she was found innocent. There were enough other things that made it seem like, you know, maybe there's a reason for her uh, innocence to be considered, you know, s sincerely. So I try not to let that go. I think there was definitely something there, something that influenced whoever it was in the house. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know if that would necessarily be her or her uncle or somebody else. I mean, it's, it's the uh, list of suspects are very, you know, there's a lot of them. And like you said, does it really matter now? You know, right. that, you know, that was what, 1892 or something. But still, you know, like you said, in, in life, she was persecuted, even though she was found innocent. And in death, I mean, she has people coming all the time wanting to talk to her and to, you know, find out. And ask calling the same her questions. back into that home. Yeah, right. calling her back into a place that she was so uncomfortable and unhappy. In. And it's just, it's really tragic. So I have a hard time with continually calling on a spirit like that. And, yeah. and leave it be. It was an interesting, an interesting time. It was an interesting investigation. I'm glad I got to be a part of it. And there were so many things that didn't make it on, on the screen. Uh, you know, we had, um, some of our cameramen were, uh, um, very good cameramen that work for national geographic and have been out in the field watching leopards eat gazelles, you know what I mean? And they mm. just have to do their job. And these guys were baffled by the fact that independent cameras started powering off by themselves wow, yeah. and they couldn't get equipment to work properly. And then we had some of those X cameras that were positioned throughout the house and those kept shutting down. So it was really unnerving uh, for the uh, cameraman and the, the production company as well. Oh, no doubt about that. Now you, uh, you were also on Hoser Files, The Hoser Files, which I think is one of the best paranormal shows. It really was a, a great, you. and you know, I agree with you. Yeah, but it, it really, it really uh, was. You know, it was. We have Hans Hoser who wrote so many hundreds of books, and and you know, and then I think it was probably an honor. I know it had to be an honor for you and the team to be able to go back and research. And, and kind of find out some things that he wasn't able to back then. The thing was, he conquered and, and, and dealt with most of those hauntings on his own. What we were doing was not going back to double check his work. He firmly believed the case was never closed, that a haunted location would remain haunted, maybe not by the ghosts that he dealt with in Elb Crossover, but that once you close that chapter, something else might step forward. And that's what we were finding in a lot of these locations where th there were other elements of the stories that needed to be told from other spirits' perspectives. And that's what we really focused on. Now, you know what? One of my favorite episodes of The Hoser Files, and it was when, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the episode, but it was when uh, it was in a mansion and 
she kept saying my boys will return or something like that or the the lady and and then when y'all had the uh gentleman that hadn't been there like 50 years come in right and her spirit you could see it she just like was so excited and just came across the um the staircase and and that was to me that was such a moving moment because you know we were thinking about maybe um you know maybe she was talking about her sons or, or this one or that one but she was talking about the two little boys that had lived there before and yeah. i just one of them became one of them became a butler at the white house i believe it was like a oh. docent there oh really so and he was the one that came um yeah and he still wants to when he dies he wants to be interred there somewhere on the property or have his ashes sprinkled there so uh chris was his name great yes. guy fascinating story and that caught one of the in my opinion, caught one of the greatest pieces of paranormal evidence I've ever seen. It was just amazing. I mean, it was like a, um, almost like right a full body apparition. And she just, right. as just soon as he walked right in, there in front of you, yeah, just started to come out of the air. And then just, you said almost looked like a woman in a long flowing gown or almost like an angel. And yes. then it just kind of appeared and then went around the corner and up the flight of stairs. And actually I, I was a little perturbed with production because they clip it. There's the extended version where when you hear, as soon as it crosses and goes up the stairs and mm -hmm. vanishes from view, you hear my voice say, oh, Cindy, we're not alone. Someone just came in the room and I have the K, uh, I have the SLS camera focused on it. And sure enough, something walked into the room. So we caught it on two cameras, one wow. downstairs as it manifested and one as it entered the room that I was in. That's just amazing. And speaking of uh, Cindy Kaza, I mean, mm -hmm. you, she was on the Holzer Falls with you and then the Ghost of Devil's Perch yep. also. And, and then she just did the last season of Dead Files. Yes, and I, I was wanting to get into that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it, it seems like a lot of several shows are in their last season or had their last season. Yes. You know, I have Discovery Plus and it was like, oh, got new shows all the time. You know, the Holzer Falls right. and the Ghost of Devil's Perch and then uh, Steve Shippey, you know, and Cindy with the Shock Docs and the right. um, just so many shows. And then all of a sudden it just went pff, nothing. Well, the Discovery Network, mm -hmm. um, they went in and bought Warner Brothers HBO. And when they purchased that, and this is all public information, you can go read all the articles, they bought 50 billion dollars in debt uh i believe is is the correct money so um 50 billion dollars that they had to try to dig themselves out of i can't uh, even imagine so, yeah so they they really focused you know being hbo warner brothers now discovery they really focused on on their biggest properties that were going to bring in the quickest bang for their buck so a lot of the reality tv stuff kind of went under the wire for now. So they canceled a lot of the shows. We're all hoping that once things settle down, they definitely know that there's a place for, for the paranormal and there's a huge audience out there. They just uh, had to focus and, and reallocate their money to a different situation right now. But we're all out there. We're all putting our irons in the fire. There are some different programs that are going to be popping up on different networks. And hopefully at some point you'll get a chance to see me back on your TV screen. And with, God's grace, I hope that it is with Cindy and with Shane, because I'd love to work with them again. Yeah, they're both are amazing. You know, Shane was in the Hoser Falls Weedy, and then he was on 28 Days Haunted. And yeah. uh, that was amazing to be, in, you know, in one place for 28 days. Is that something that you would do, or do you have a, a tap out at like two nights or a night? Or Oh, no, I would I would love to. As a matter of fact, I was uh, the production company that made 28 Days Haunted was also the production company that did the... Uh, ghost to devil's perch and originally they wanted me for 28 days haunted mm -hmm. and uh network had my contract and they're like no we want them on ghost to devil's perch and they had reached out and, and said i'm so, you know dave this is what we want you to do and, and he said boy it really bums me out I, I wanted you for this investigative aspect of the show he goes now i gotta find a team of three and i said well you know shane from the holzer files has a paranormal team called the searchers mm -hmm. and it's the three of them he interviewed them, brought two of them on in a medium that I suggested, and they became a team on the show. Uh, but I would love the opportunity to spend 30 days locked into one haunted location and just kind of give it my all. But Shane really had a neat opportunity that his first TV series, he got to walk in the footsteps of Dr. Hans Holzer, 
Right. And for the second series he was a part of, he was following Ed and Lorraine Warren's kind of protocols. I mean, you can't get more, you know, royalty, paranormal yeah. royalty than that, you know, um, yep. Ed and Lorraine. And, you know, it, it's just, I really was excited when Cindy, you know, uh, Amy had picked her out to be on the Dead Files. And I was really mm -hmm. excited, you know, like, here we go, because I always had admire her work. And, and what's nice is the Dead Files is made by the same company that did Holzer Files. So it was a, a natural jump for her to go over and uh, fill in for Amy. Right. And, and it's just amazing because, you know, when you were talking about when you were doing Lizzie Borden and how when, when um, you know, the spirit was there with you and you started like, and Chris was saying about basically like doing automatic writing. And that's something mm -hmm. that uh, Cindy always, you know, she's really into that, the automatic writing. And, and it's, right. it really takes a, you know, for for someone, do you think that you have maybe some medium um, or psychic tendencies, or you just kind of picked up things over the years? Or well, I think that having been part of the paranormal for so long, steeped in this environment, you start to pick up on some of that. You start to pick up on some of the sensitivities of a location or a spirit itself. So I wouldn't say I'm a full-blown medium. I guess if I worked at it, I, I feel I probably could become one. I'm not sure. I, you know, I mean, I, I've had psychic-like abilities most of my life. Mm -hmm. I just haven't honed that craft. I haven't built and strengthened that muscle. But maybe it's time to do that. That way I can, you know, be more more useful on an investigation. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm pretty good at going in and picking up on a location in the building that seems to have good activity and draw it to me. And there's been other times when I go into buildings and I feel drawn to a spot and immediately turn on my recorder and start getting back and forth conversation with the spirit. So there is some element of mediumship that's already a part of who I am. And then I found out, ooh, what about three, four years ago uh, through Ancestry.com, I finally found my biological father and siblings. And he laughed. He said, I went and looked at your Facebook and social media, and I'm not surprised that you're into the paranormal that's very strong on our side of the family. Your yeah. great grandmother was a famous gypsy queen in Scotland. And I, my, my bio dad reads cards and my sisters have seen ghosts. So it seems to be a, a genetic aspiration or a, you know, genetic link to who I am. You know, like it's supposed to pass down generations and yet you didn't really know that. And right. then you still was able to pick it up and, and yep. you know, so that just really is another cool aspect on, like you said, uh, genetics and heredity and, and that's a whole nother show. But, uh, it, <laughs> <laughs> so the Ghost of Devil's Perch, that was in uh, Butte, Montana? Yes. Okay. And it seems like that that was a hot spot there for a while for paranormal shows because you had the Ghost Town Terror also around Butte and Anaconda, and then you right. had y'all, and so it was like, I didn't know Butte was such a happening place. I knew they had the brothel, but I didn't know about all the other stuff. Yeah, the um, Butte was crazy haunted. There were so many things there that were active, so many places, and the more you talk to the people of Butte, the more you realize, I don't think there was a place in town that wasn't haunted. I talked to so many people that were like, oh, yeah, you're the, you're one of the guys on that new show, right? And I'm like, yeah. And they're like, you should come over here. No, 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 you should come over there. You know, this hospital's haunted. That hospital's haunted. Our building's haunted. Our, our restaurant is haunted. It just was such a part. But when you realize that there are all those tunnels that connect each one of the places around town, and there's been so much tragedy underground from the mines mm -hmm. that it's really not a surprise that these uh, places are still so lively. And with, you know all of the the reconstruction and work that they're doing now in in and around Butte again kind of an interesting deal that they might be stirring those spirits up and we we got a call to go in there and investigate it we did and we had a lot of activity and tracked it down to who we believe was the the culprit for this yeah I really like that series and thank you um you know it was really good and had KD uh Stafford he is an inventor yeah. uh investigator and and um I don't, I don't know. I, I'm trying to think of the word that y'all was using to describe him, but he's kind of like a jack of all trades. With he comes up with this, yeah, crazy he was our inventions. Tech, our tech guru, yes, yeah. tech good guru for real. And so I had a laugh. I said, so I've been on two paranormal TV shows where it's Cindy and myself, and then we're paired with some 
uh, country boy. Uh, right. <laughs> Shane, Shane being from Georgia and I think Kentucky for uh, KD. So it was funny that the, both of our, our our tech guys were from the South, and uh, but they brought a different standard and way of investigating and looking at things. So it was great. Is there like somewhere that you haven't investigated, but you really want to? Tons of places. And I've been lucky enough to go around the world. Last year alone, I went to Egypt and got to investigate a few of the Pharaoh's tombs, including oh, King Tut's tomb. Nice. I got to investigate Germany and Prague and England. Uh, so I, I really have had a blessed life doing things. So, I mean, there's plenty of places. I would love to get into the White House at some point. That would be a, a goal of mine. Um, I, I love places that are really entrenched in historic relevance and value because it feels like I'm, I'm being inserted into one of the pages of the history book of that location. And I love that, not for my own ego, not for my own, but just to know that I stood in the place that George Washington used as a stronghold during the American Revolutionary War, or I stood in the place where Ben Franklin squared off against the King's men in a negotiation ploy to get us to lay down our weapons and just go back to the the kingdom. And, and they would get all of these great, um, you know, titles bestowed upon them and money bestowed upon them if they just give it up. And Ben Franklin stood for our country and said no, and and that was at the conference house. So I, you know, I got to stand in that room. Yeah. And granted, they were only there for I think three or four hours of its entirety of its history. But there was so much more, and we realized that the stories that were wanting to be told had nothing to do with Benjamin Franklin or any of the element of of the King's Men. What it was was the native and uh, indigenous tribes that had been so brutally slaughtered in that area. Mm -hmm. It had been whitewashed over and forgotten about, and it was important and imperative for us to remind people of that very uncomfortable nature. And it, it that episode itself kind of pissed a lot of people off because, you know, we were pointing out just how brutal uh, we were when we first settled this country. And you know, people I think that took it all oh, as you're you're attacking Americans. No, I'm not attacking Americans at all. As a matter of fact, these were the pre-Americans. These were the British settlers that were coming over on behalf of the king to start setting up over here. This is before we started coming in and saying, nope, we're taking over. This is our new property. You know, this was the, the fir first line that came in. But man, to think about that, I was standing there in those spots, in those places, in that part of history. So I love that. Um, you know, I, I guess I'd like to go into Amityville house for a night or two just to say I did it, but I'm in no rush for it. I don't believe that there's really anything left there. And if there is, there's probably just more of the sad spirits of, of the DeFeo family or mm -hmm. elements or echoes of them. Uh, I've not yet been to the Conjuring house. I would like to go there, um, you know, but I've, I've been blessed to go to a lot of places. Oh, yeah. And, you know, you were talking about, you know, the Conjuring House. That's a place I would love to go. And uh, have you been to Villisca? That's on my bucket list. I know Villisca is like two hours from me and I'm buddies with Johnny Hauser that runs. Oh, the yeah, place, Johnny. Yeah. Have not been there yet. And you're only two hours away. Yeah, I know. Wow. Right. It's kind of like people in Florida have Disney and they never go to it right. themselves, you know. So it's just it, it, sometimes it's it's so close that you just don't, you take it for granted. And I, I'd really hope I'm going to get there at some point. Now I wanted to say this quote, I think it was one that you maybe shared or if not, it's a good quote and we can talk about it. It says the noblest act is that of making someone happy. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, I think that's PT Barnum. It is. Yeah. And I, I uh, obviously, P.T. Barnum lived in a different age, in a different era, doing different things. And, um, you know, I, when I posted that, I took a lot of heat from people. Oh, he abused animals. He did this. They, they kind of missed the point right. that it was I was focused more on the act of trying to bring happiness to people and entertainment to people. And I hope that at some point in my history, part of my legacy will be that I was an entertainer and that people will have felt changed by what they've seen, read, or experienced in my presence around my show or reading any of my books. And I think that's a good goal, and it should be the goal of every uh, investigator or someone that's involved in the paranormal field, is what I think about bringing closure to the family 
or mm-hmm. to loved ones. And if you don't have that goal and, and someone's just there to get scared or just for the story or I don't like that. I think that's a shame because you have a chance that maybe, like you were saying, as part of history, you're there, you're in the same footsteps, you're in the same right. place. You can get maybe answers from someone who's been murdered or someone that's been in history and, and that you can communicate with them. And what you can, and I'm a firm believer in, um, you know, the true crime and psychics, you know, being able to help the more mainstream on um, being able to help more with getting uh, cold cases solved. So that's just one of my things that I think that's real good because to bring answers and happiness to someone, mm-hmm. it is, uh, you just can't measure that. I mean, no. that's a, a beautiful thing. Yeah, it is. And I'm, I'm pleased to uh, have the opportunity to be a part of these stories and be the voice for the dead, to be somebody that helps bring them back to the foreground in, in a positive way, sharing their stories. Sometimes this, so many spirits have been misunderstood as malevolent or evil or dark, when really what they are is somebody who's hurt and lashing out. And, you know, uh, Ghost of the Devil's Perch was one of those cases that here I'm kind of face to face literally with this very angry spirit that a lot of people might have hauled ass out of there um, calling it a demon and being terrified of it and I really feel that I, I stood my ground it knocked me on my ass yeah, literally it did. and figuratively and I could have run but instead I turned around and I said this is not acceptable mm-hmm. I'm here to help you I, I want to help you so tell me what your story is what can I do for you and it told me remember and here we uncover the story of this man literally one of the first people that helped to build this town. And nobody talks about him. We only talk about the winners. We talk about the the Copper Kings. We Mm -hmm. talk about the famous brothel owners, but you forget of all the the people whose backs were broken to create the town that Butte is. People need to think too, that so many spirits are restless because they're not getting answers. They're not getting the recognition. And Mm -hmm. even though uh, they have passed, they still have a voice and we have to be the one that makes the voice heard because they won't be heard unless we do it you take that time to hear the spirits convey their stories and show them the respect that they deserve in life and in death has there been a place that you have felt the most scared of uh maybe i'll do there's no place i wouldn't go back to Mm -hmm. uh because of fear there's a few i won't go back to because i felt like the story there was done or that these spirits should maybe just be left alone right um but like the the whaley house obviously Mm -hmm. you know i'm a big bad ghost hunter uh but i got knocked on my ass for the first time by something spiritual and that really shook my paradigm because i'd seen it on tv and even though i was friends with all of these people the concept that something had that much power i just couldn't wrap my head around it so it, it was never very real for me and then to have that experience unfold and physically get knocked to the ground was earth shattering. It, it it shifted everything for me, but it also made me much more aware of the situation. And it gave me an appreciation for what the spirit is going through. And that was an important realization because then I realized, uh, you know, as a father, I'm witnessing a, a kind of a petulant child lashing out mm-hmm. and how frustrating it must be for these spirits that they're there coexisting with us and uh, trying to tell their story, trying to be heard, and people aren't really listening. They're focused on the salaciousness. They're focused on sometimes the wrong elements or aspects of the story, and that does the spirit world a great disservice, I believe. Well, yeah, because you think as an investigator, you like so many like are after that high. Mm-hmm. Instead of wanting to help or be a voice, they're more into the high. Like, okay, it's got to be more scary. It's got to be more dangerous. It's got to be more dark. And it just keeps going and going. And then you wonder what's enough. What would be enough for well, this person? I do feel bad. Sometimes I've been on public investigations where somebody comes up to me with an EVP and they're so excited. This is their first true contact. And sometimes I forget how important that is to them. And I, I've got this kind of jaded exterior where it's like, oh, yeah, good. And I just realized, oh, that was kind of a crappy way to react because 
I remember when I got my first EVP and I remember that moment when I realized this is real and it's so exciting. So I've tried to be um, more energized for people in the moment when they have that experience, but you do get jaded after a while. You get to the point where you see things and now I'm kind of waiting for just like the flaming skulls to come flying down the hallway at me to really get my blood pumping again, because shadow figures, I've seen them right. uh, strange, you know, an, a, amorphous black blobs or white smoke or, or even full on apparitions I've seen. So it's kind of like, yeah, all right, been there, done that, got the t-shirt to prove it. Right. What else is, what else is there? But I, again, that's why I try to remove myself from the element of ghost hunting. And in, in, in exchange, it's more of a paranormal investigation to find out why they're there and understand the spirit. And, and I'm really not there for Misty who called me in to investigate the home. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm more there for the spirit to give the spirit answers. And because I believe if I fix that problem, that's going to make Misty's problem go away too. Right. If that makes sense. I, I put the spirits issues above the fleshies. It does because, you know, flesh, you can go somewhere and get help and talk or, you know, right. whatever you need. And then the spirit, you're just kind of like, you don't know if somebody can hear you or, right. you know, you right. Or you hear somebody can hear you and they get freaked out and leave. And right. then you're kind of like, well, why'd you come here? You know, right. It's gotta be so frustrating for a ghost. Uh, is there someone here? Yes. What can I do? Help. All right. Goodbye. And then what? <laughs> you know, they said, help, help. let's wait, go. Wait, what? <laughs> Right. And they, they, they don't go in there truly prepared to help because they don't really know how to help. Well, let's break out sage and wave it around. Well, that's good for helping to try to deflect negative energy, get things out. It's not really going to get rid of a spirit that doesn't mean you any harm. Quest, a, tr a journey into true crime and the paranormal is sponsored by the following. Shelf Ron's Gumbo Stop right in Mer Bettery. If you want award-winning gumbo, well, you need to go to an award-winning shelf. Uh, Shelf Ron and has the best gumbo and just so many different things on his menu jambalaya, fried chicken, po' boys. Believe me, you won't leave there hungry uh, because it's really a great place to eat. Uh, we are also sponsored by the Haunted Hotel on Earth Lines. And if you would like to go and stay at a haunted place, go to hauntedhotelnola.com and book your room. And believe me, you will not be disappointed because I have personally stayed there a few times overnight. And yeah, it's definitely haunted. Uh, make sure you mark your calendars for March the 23rd. New Iberia is having their very own Paracon. It's called uh, Cajun Country Paracon. Uh, we are also a sponsor of their Paracon, and you'll be able to uh, come, and we'll be up there. We'll have a table. They have a lot of uh, big-name paranormal people in the paranormal field, paranormal stars, celebrities. You really won't want to miss that. You can go on to Eventbrite and get your... They have a, a few VIP tickets left, and that way you can go on to a inf investigation that night with a uh, paranormal celebrity. So I'm really looking forward to that. And also, uh, Louisiana Pizza Kitchen Uptown, every Wednesday is fa uh, Friends and Family Night. My favorite is all adult beverages are half off, even bottles of wine. So, I mean, it's a Carrollton and St. Charles. You don't want to miss it. It's a wonderful place. They're even open on Sundays and have uh, mimosas and Bloody Marys. So be sure to check out Louisiana P Pizza Kitchen Uptown. And Area 51 Gallery, uh, Rocket, They make he makes these uh, pins. He can make your business merch, anything that you need, something for your crew, your business. Uh, be sure to reach out to uh, Rocket at Area 51 Gallery. 18 years that you've been in the field is yes. there okay so you think from 18 years ago all the way up to now the technology is so different i mean you know like looking back on hans Holzer, but is it is it really i mean you, you look back hans holzer really was very rudimentary it mm -hmm. was an audio recorder a camera right. and eventually when he got to it a video camera or film mm -hmm. um but it was the basics and that's kind of what i still do i stick to the audio recorder a camera and a video camera and that's about it and now thankfully all of that is in one phone right you can carry that with you yes. and you can record <laughs> and videotape and take photographs so we've kind of tapered it down but 
I don't know that, that the technology is any more improved over the 18 years. We've certainly seen new ways to utilize technology. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the problem. You know, so many people have lambasted the paranormal TV shows because they're out there using all these tools that are not meant for ghost hunting. No, that's fine. But, you know, some of the coolest inventions in the world were created utilizing something that already existed and manipulating it for something else. Mm -hmm. And what we were doing with those original tools, we're not going in to communicate with ghosts. We were going in to debunk the claims of ghosts by using an EMF detector, a K2 meter, uh, you know, an induction probe to try to find uh, and even thermal cameras. Is there a leak? Is that what's causing this cold breeze? Is right. there high levels of electron, you know, electric uh, magnetic fields or forces that are leaking from old wiring that could be giving you? Because we know that'll give you hallucinations or at least stimulate you into paranoid feelings. So we're, we were using those tools to try to understand what might be a natural cause for the feelings and sensations and experiences that uh, that somebody was having. And then we started to realize that if we are picking up a geomagnetic or a magnetic electromagnetic frequency and this thing fluctuates, it might be able to utilize it as a very basic communication tool. So we started examining that. And then, you know, like the Frank's boxes, the spirit right. boxes, these things that you see everywhere, that's not new. Frank got that from, I want to say it was like a, like early 70s, maybe early 80s popular mechanics magazine where somebody had kind of considered it and created it and he rebuilt it and and it became the Frank's box, Frank Sumption. Mm -hmm. And that popularized, didn't brought it back to the public eye in 2006, 2007. So there's really none of that's that new. It's just been innovative into the way it's been packaged. And Bill Chappell, Gary Galka, right. so many of the great inventors out there have tried to find ways to take so many of our hypotheses and, and concepts and see if they could find a way to measure uh, the results in those realms. If we're truly getting, uh, if, if ghosts are believed to live in this light realm, what can we do to film in that light realm what could we do to audibly listen or record in that audible realm or you know frequency so that's been kind of cool and telling but i don't know that it's delivered enough proof to people uh, of of what's really going on out there like i said the, the holzer files to me we captured some of the greatest evidence i've ever seen on tv and not just because i was a part of the show just we were dumb luck we were in the right place at the right time with the right team and we caught some of the best evidence but you rarely hear people talk about it. Another uh, episode that I did like, um, well, I liked them all about on the Hoser Files, but when, when y'all did the, the train. Oh, right. Yeah. The, uh, the, hand. the phantom, phantom hand episode. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That was, that was really amazing. Was that like, if I'm remembering correctly, was that in Chicago or? No, it was uh, near Cleveland, Ohio. Okay. And uh, we had gone there and this, this case was so wild uh, we were sad to find out that we went there, the kind of apartment complex where the story began for Hans Holzer had been torn down. Mm -hmm. But this family, we found the son who still was alive, an African-American family that lived there. They had the lower level of floor apartment and they would hear things in the, the crawl space underneath the apartment in the, in the cellar. And they were having all kinds of problems. Finally, they called the police the police came and saw something and saw a hand reaching out. And when they kept calling out and it wouldn't respond, they just emptied a full clip into the floor. Uh, and when they opened up the, the door, there was nothing there. There was no trace of blood. There was nothing. And there was no way that they missed. They were, you know, a foot and a half, two feet away from this thing, just emptying rounds into the area where this being was. Um, and so many people had continued to have weird experiences. And then you find out, well, there was a, a mass murderer that was working in and around that whole area, disposing of bodies and body parts. Um, you know, the torso killer. It was a very dark, creepy story all the way around. I don't think they ever caught the torso killer, did they? No. And, and as a matter of fact, I think there was a cause to believe that maybe... It went. So he went somewhere further down the track, and and it went near Iowa, and yeah. very well could have ended up near the Velisca Axe Murder House. So, well, I didn't want to bring it up again because I already mentioned right. axe murders. I always work it into the yep. show, no matter who I'm talking to. And we had actually, when Sam was here and Brandon, um, we actually was talking about how 
that we feel, and, and I guess that you do too, like a lot of the axe murders may be connected. Yeah, there's probably a good possibility, and maybe not even just physically. What if there's something spiritually about that that kind of came through? See, I could talk about that all night. But uh, let's talk about your show real quick, Uh, The Paranormal 60. It is on Mm -hmm. YouTube. Uh, Be sure to go and like and subscribe, Dave's uh, Paranormal 60. And you are also on Wednesday nights. Yes, Monday and Wednesday nights. Mm -hmm. uh, It is live on youtube if you can't watch it live because you're watching i don't know say another show yeah like me you can always go (laughs) check out the paranormal 60 and then click the live tab and you'll see all the past episodes there and it's free to subscribe and watch along uh and there's plenty of room for all of us to coexist in here and promote so i appreciate you bringing me on and loving me talk about the show um but that show is live two nights a week if you listen to podcasts we do have the Paranormal 60 Podcast Network, mm-hmm. and Mondays you'll get the audio of uh, New England Legends with Jeff Belanger and Ray Auger, and then on Tuesdays you get the Paranormal 60. Wednesdays you get the Monsters Lounge with Tressa and Jenny, and then Thursdays you get the Paranormal 60 News, and then Fridays you get True Hauntings with Ann and Renata from Australia. So I have a full week's worth of different programming uh, choices and options for you and great different aspects and takes on a lot of the different elements of the supernatural and history and folklore. So that's all available and it's all free wherever you listen to your podcasts. That's really cool. You know, I've always said do it, being able to do what you love mm-hmm. is such a blessing because not everyone gets to do that. No, no. And it, it, I think everybody could. They just sometimes are afraid to take that leap of faith and uh, follow their dreams and follow what they want. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a firm believer in listening and intuiting and, in you know, uh, manifesting things uh, yeah. because I believe that that will, will come true. Look, at one point I wanted to, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an author and a writer and, uh, and a radio guy and on TV. And here I am Boom. and I've, I've been on TV. I've been on radio. I've just released my first new book, The Theater of the Mind, yes. uh, Tales from the Darkness, which is a book about strange supernatural occurrences, everything from the Bloody Bones Man to Black Eyed Children to ghosts to aliens, UFOs, and uh, even time slip phenomena. And that book is out and available now. So if your listeners around the world are interested, they can find it on Amazon.com. If they'd like an autographed copy, they can go to my website at paranormal60.com. That's paranormal60.com. And they can order the book off of their autographed. Now, are you going to have some of those books at the Paracon? Yes. Okay. Yeah, wherever I go this year, I'll be bringing a stack of books with me to sign and and, uh, sell at the events. Okay, because I want to get a book from you. You got it. Yeah. You got it. (laughs) So that would be cool. So everybody, uh, Dave Schrader, the Paranormal 60. The Hoser Files, Ghost of Devil's Perch, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you so much for being a guest here on my show. Thank you. You're welcome. And be sure, y'all, March the 23rd, if you haven't got your tickets yet to go to the Cajun uh, Country Paracon in New Iberia on March the 23rd, you should. And it's going to be a great – are you hosting the VIP event? I'm going to be there all weekend doing whatever they want me to do. So juggling cats, drinking Bloody Marys, singing a song, maybe doing a dance. I don't know. I'll be there. I'll, right. I'll be happy to do whatever they need from me. We're doing the uh, the VIP thing. So if I see a Bloody Mary, I'm there. So All right. All right. Sounds fantastic. <laughs> Thanks a lot for involving me in on the show. And I just hope that listeners around the world find a little light in the darkness from conversations like this and that they don't feel so isolated and alone thinking that there's nobody else that's going through this or that they'll just be made to feel stupid for seeing and witnessing extraordinary things. Don't look at it as though you're being picked upon, but look upon it more as it's a gift to be able to see and experience things that go far beyond our normal understanding. Definitely, and I couldn't say it better myself. And everyone, you have a good night, and good night to you, Dave. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.